Let's get started with Chapter 1, Lecture 1, Fundamental Concepts. So most of you hopefully have had the first part of uh, Measuring Thermo. And uh, so you're kind of familiar with some of these uh, terms. However, uh, let's talk a little bit about the differences between thermodynamics and heat transfer. So in both cases, heat is the form of energy that can be that's transferred from one system to another as a result of a temperature difference. Thermodynamics is concerned with the amount of heat transfer a system when it goes, uh, as it goes from one equilibrium position to another equilibrium state. Heat transfer deals with the determination of the rates of, of energy transfers. So we're talking about, you know, how long it, ta how long it takes to get from uh, one state to another state. So as we know, the transfer of heat is always from the higher temperature medium to the lower temperature medium. Uh, and heat transfer stops when the two mediums reach the same temperature. We call that equilibrium. Heat transfer can be in three different modes, either conduction, convection, and radiation. We'll talk a little bit about the differences between those two in the upcoming slides. So here's the our book has this slide where it talks about uh, the differences between thermal and heat transfer. And, and again, uh, if for heat transfer, we're really, really interested in uh, how long it takes for an object to go from one temperature another, to another temperature. In thermal, we really wasn't worried about how long. We were just worried, worried about, uh, you know, the initial state and the final state. We didn't really care about how long, how long it took to get there. On the other hand, heat transfer uh, adds that other element to, uh, to thermal. So they're although they're related, they're a little bit different. So what are some applications of, of heat transfer? So most of you are, are either going to go out and work as either mechanical engineers or electrical engineers. Uh, some of you might decide to go on to graduate school and be civil engineers. And all engineering uses heat transfer. So for example, for a mechanical engineer, you're usually interested in, in heat exchangers, turbine systems, internal combustion engines. Electrical engineering, you're, you're trying to work on cooling systems for motors, generators, and transformers. And civil engineers, they're trying to design bridges, but they have to worry about uh, the flow of uh, uh, conduction heat uh, inside the metals that made up of the bridge. So, so they really have to, have to figure that in, either model it or run, or run simulations on, on how, uh, you know, as the temperatures vary throughout the day and the year, how's that gonna affect your bridge? So they're worried about uh, heat transfer in that kind of uh, situation. And also there, a lot of civil engineers get involved with uh, designing uh, heat and air systems for, for buildings, uh, you know, commercial kind of buildings. So they, have, they also have to study uh, heat transfer. So what are the different modes of heat transfer? There, there are three different modes that we'll study throughout the semester. Uh, the first one is what's called conduction, and that's heat flow by direct contact. So, for example, if you have a hot cup of coffee and you put a cool spoon in the hot cup of coffee and you wait a little while, you'll find that the heat is conducted from the hot uh, coffee uh, into the spoon and travels up the spoon. And so when you pick up the spoon, it's changed temperature. So that conduction is very specific. It, it, two objects have to be in direct contact with each other to, to have that. Convection is heat flow by moving fluid. So for example, a lot of our central heat and air systems work this way. They, they, uh, they heat air and they use fans to move it uh, uh, into a different space. And so that's, that's, they can heat up a room by, by, by moving air. So that's basically convection. Radiation is a little bit different. Radiation is the only mode that uh, doesn't need a medium to travel through. So, so what do I mean by medium is that uh, it can it can work inside a vacuum. And the best example of this is uh, how our Earth gets uh, heat from the sun. Uh, the sun gives off electromagnetic waves that travel through uh, the vacuum of space and then hit Earth. Uh, so it travels without the uh, 
uh, having to have a medium. We also, you can see that also from a from a uh, a hot object like a, a a radiant heater works this way as well. Um, you know, so you can have a convection uh, heater that that has a fan to move move hot air, but radiant heaters they can heat just by the by giving off the EM, EM waves. Um, they don't have to have a, a fan. So, so what are some of the fundamental laws of heat transfer that we'll talk about throughout the semester? Well, two of these you've, you're pretty familiar with. The first law of thermo uh, gets uh, this conservation of energy. The second law of thermo sort of tells you the direction of heat, heat flow. Uh, equation of continuity, this gives the conservation of, of mass. Uh, we'll talk about the equation of flow, which is the Navier-Stokes equations. These are a set of uh, differential equations that we'll use to solve for various uh, types of, of heat flow. There's also the three different modes have their own, own equations. The, for conduction, we'll work with Fourier's law of conduction. Convection, we'll work with Newton's law of cooling. And for radiation, you have what's known as the uh, Stefan Boltzmann's law. There's also, we'll have equations for fluid properties, such as specific heat, thermal conductivity, viscosity, et cetera, the, the standard ones we pull over from, from uh, fluid mechanics and thermal. So heat transfer really is uh, kind of a combination of, of thermo and heat and uh, uh, fluid mechanics mixed with a set of differential equations that tells us how long it's going to take to heat something up or cool something down. So we talked about thermo. When you talked about thermo in your thermal class, you talked about uh, uh, internal energy, which we represent as U, and we talked about the uh, combination of properties. For example, the pressure times the uh, the velocity. We we call that the uh, 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 you know the flowing energy. Uh, and we defined what's called the enthalpy as the as the sum of u plus p times v. And so back when you were in thermo you, and you had all the thermal property tables, uh, you know you looked up. Um, you, hopefully you're kind of familiar with with uh, enthalpy. Uh, so in this term, p times v, this is the the flow energy. So here, so if you have a fluid, for example, you have uh, in a stationary fluid, it just has internal energy. Uh, that's you. But if the fluid's flowing, it also has energy due to the flow. And so that's defined as the pressure times the velocity. Using other properties from thermal, we talked about the, the specific heat. And, you know, there's two kinds of specific heat uh, you studied. One was the uh, specific heat at constant volume, CV, uh, specific heat at constant pressure, CP. Uh, so both of these terms we're, we're going to use in, in fluid flow. Um, so here you have to you have tables you have to look these values up in. Uh, so in general, this, these specific heats really depend on uh, the temperature and pressure. Uh, so we'll you know we'll, you're familiar with a little bit with these, but as we do move through the semester and work some problems, you'll get more familiar with how how these terms work. Some more properties from thermo we can uh, we'll be using in heat transfer is the formulas for uh, uh, change in the internal energy and change in enthalpy. Uh, so here, uh, small u is the uh, internal energy per unit mass, and uh, small h is the enthalpy per unit mass. Um, so uh, C V times delta T that's the internal energy per unit mass, and Cp times delta T, that's the enthalpy per unit mass. If you want to find the, the uh, internal energy or enthalpy, of course, you got to multiply by the mass uh, in both cases. So uh, Cp and Cv only really uh, uh, depend if you have a, a, a gas, uh, typically, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, some liquids, uh, there's a the small change in Cp or Cv, but uh, it's mostly effective for gases, but certainly for a solid object like like a metal, CP and CV are equal. There, there's just only one value and they call it a C. So for in that case, uh, 
delta u is just m times c average delta t. A few more terms we can define is what's known as the heat transfer rate and the heat flux. So here, if you have uh, uh, Q is the heat transfer, uh, Q dot is the heat transfer rate, it's the heat transfer per unit time. So if you know what Q dot is, you can simply integrate, uh, you know, if you know what it is as a function of time, you can integrate with respect to time from zero to delta T and you can find the total energy that's, that's being, the heat that's being transferred. Of course, when Q dot is constant, this is a pretty simple integral. Uh, Q dot can come outside the integral, and so this becomes Q dot times delta T. Another term we're, you often see is what's known as the heat flux. The heat flux is the uh, heat transfer rate divided by the area, uh, unit normal area. So here's a case where if you have uh, uh, the Q dot is 24 watts, uh, that's the heat transfer rate, and the area is a 3, three meter by 2 meter uh, square block. Uh, so the, the area is, is uh, 3 times 2, uh, 6 square meters. So you can divide 24 watts by 6 square meters and you get four, the, the heat flux is 4 watts per uh, square minute. Uh, I'm sorry, 4 watts per, per uh, square meter. Um, so that's, uh, that's a pretty simple way to, to calculate uh, uh, heat flux if you know the heat transfer rate. So let's look at it. the first example of the textbook. He has a, a 10 centimeter diameter copper ball. It's heated from 100 degrees C uh, to an average temperature of 150 degrees C in 30 minutes. Taking the average density and specific heat of copper uh, to be uh, 8950 kilograms per cubic meter and CP is 0.395 kilogram, uh, kilo, um, uh, kilojoules kilograms degree C. We want to find the total amount of heat transferred to the copper ball and the average rate of heat transfer to the ball and the average heat flux. So here, you know, you're really going to have to um, commit these terms to memory because you got three different terms. The total amount of heat, the average rate of heat transfer, and the average heat flux. So you have to know the differences between those two. So here we can calculate the amount of heat uh, transferred we can simply use the formula that we looked at before where Q was equal to uh, delta U equals to MC uh, times the difference in temperature. Now we have to know what the mass is. Uh, he didn't give us the mass, uh, but we know what the density is. So we can, uh, the mass is simply the density times the volume and it's a sphere. So uh, that's four thirds pi r cubed. So we can plug in the values that are given we can calculate the mass to be 4.686 kilograms. Then we can plug in the formula. We know uh, now we have the mass. We found that. Uh, we know what C average is. We were told that. And we know what the difference in temperature is. So we can calculate the, the uh, heat transfer is 92.6 kilojoules. Now part B asks for the, the rate of heat transfer. So that's the a Q that we just found divided by the time. So it was uh, 1800 seconds. So we could we can divide these out and get uh, 51.4 watts. Part C asks for the, the heat flux. So now to know the heat flux, uh, you have to know what the area is. And so uh, for a sphere, you're talking about the surface area. Uh, so one way to find the surface area uh, it's basically surface area is a derivative of volume with respect to uh, R, dVdr. So the volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Uh, D, uh, uh, take the derivative of this with respect to R and you get 4 pi r squared. So the flux is uh, Q dot divided by the surface area, Q dot divided by 4 pi r squared. Now we could, he gave us the diameter, we could take the, um, uh, we could find the R because uh, it's just the diameter divided by two, but uh, so since R is, is uh, D divided by two, if you uh, square that out, uh, this four will cancel that one. And so you end up with pi D squared. So four pi R squared is equal to pi D squared. If you know, if, 
that looks confusing this just work it out uh, mathematically take 4 pi and then plug in uh, d over 2 square it and the, the fours will cancel uh, so we found that Q dot average was 51.4 watts pi times D uh, He gave us D so so we could uh, calculate it as 1,636 watts per square meter Okay, that's the end of lecture one. Uh, I'll see you in lecture two